All right, awesome, we're live. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much to Dr. Julia King for joining us today. Dr. Julia is a psychologist and a yoga instructor who specializes in IBS, anxiety, and emotional eating. So today we're gonna to be talking about the IBS and anxiety connection. Um, also a little bit about acid reflux and just about mental health, wellness, how to balance IBS and um, anxiety. So thanks so much, Julia. Oh, I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited for our conversation. Awesome. So for people that may not be familiar with your work, would you like to give a little bit of a backstory on who you are and what you do? Yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm a psychologist and a yoga teacher, and I have an integrated mind-body approach to um, treating anxiety. Initially, um, I well, so I was initially a forensic psychologist when I got out of graduate school. Um, I actually went into graduate school with the sole intention of becoming a forensic psychologist and um, was very goal focused and very driven in doing that and accomplished that goal, created a private practice um, and was working solely in the area of forensics, which was mostly in the context of criminal evaluation. So insanity, uh, not guilty by reason of insanity evaluations, competency to stand trial, very, very different uh, than what I'm doing now. And I had no intention of ever being a therapist, uh, interestingly enough. So, um, I, so I will jokingly say that yoga um, kind of screwed up my life in that um, I had kind of this inkling that maybe I wanted to do something a little bit different, not get out of forensic entirely, but maybe balance that with something um, a, little, a little different. Um, and so I ended up in yoga teacher training for my own personal benefit and development. And when I got in there, I started realizing that there were all of these connections between all the psychotherapy that I had learned in graduate school, cognitive behavioral therapy in particular, um, and yoga philosophy. Um, and so that just got me really fired up. I got super excited about that kind of went on like a little bit of a deep dive in reading everything I could find on, on the connections between those two. So that's kind of the spark that led me to where I am now. Um, long story short, I ended up phasing out of forensic entirely, which was a surprise even to me. Um, but it just really kind of organically happened. So I launched my clinical practice and I started working with, um, lots of different kinds of folks, folks dealing with lots of different kinds of difficulties and struggles, but it became clear pretty quickly, um, that anxiety was my jam, that those are the folks I get. That's the work I love. I really understand and can, the way that I practice is just really well suited, um, to treating that condition. So, um, my practice is so not solely, but primarily focused on anxiety. And you mentioned irritable bowel and also emotional eating and body image, but I see so much overlap with anxiety in those conditions as well, that it just, it all, it all just feels pretty seamless. And, um, we'll, we'll probably talk about this a little bit today, but, um, I used to be a planner and a decider and a look ahead header, right. Um, and kind of crafting what my path was going to be. And I have learned to relax that a bit, which makes me a very good anxiety therapist because I can talk to my clients about how to, they can learn how to do that as well, because I would have never predicted that I would be here doing what I'm doing now based on, you know, what my, what I initially thought that path was going to look like. So. I love that. I think that your story is so incredible and having that focus of anxiety and body image and um, IBS that's so interrelated and, and, um, just my own experience, but also what I've heard from other people, that's something that is totally abundant in, in culture. So, um, diving right in, I'd love to talk about the gut brain connection. I feel like that term gets thrown around and, um, let's talk about that. How does our gut connect to our mind and that conversation? Yep. So um, let's do a little anatomy physiology lesson to start, right? So if we're talking about, it's all about the nervous system. So if we're talking about the nervous system, there are two main levels um, at the top. So we have the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. And then we have the second, um, second type of nervous system, which is the peripheral nervous system, which is everything else. Right. And this is of course, like super basic, um, anatomy 101 nervous system 101, right? So if we're in the peripheral nervous system, which is not the brain and spinal cord, then we have two other levels. Um, we have the somatic nervous system, which is all the voluntary stuff 
that we can actually control in our nervous system. And then we have the autonomic nervous system, which is all the stuff we can't control. We go down another level from there, from the autonomic nervous system, and we divide that into three. And all three of those levels are relevant for anxiety and also for digestion. So the first level of that is the sympathetic nervous system, which is where our fight or flight response resides in our threat center, right? If we need to take action and we need to GFO if we're under threat, right? Then our sympathetic nervous system is gonna take care of us in that situation. Um, sometimes our sympathetic nervous system is on overdrive when we're anxious, right? And that shows up in our GI system, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but so that is a sympathetic nervous system is our action oriented, um, the part of our nervous system. And then we have the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the rest and digest part of the nervous system. And if you're familiar with the vagus nerve, um, the parasympathetic nerve is 75% the vagus nerve and digestion is a huge part of what the vagus nerve is responsible for. Um, but then the gut brain connection, when we're really talking about that gut brain connection, what we're talking about is the enteric nervous system, which is the third level of our autonomic nervous system. And that nervous system sole function is to control and regulate, um, our digestion. And it is, consists of a hundred million nerve cells um, two tiny little layers that are hundred million nerve cells between um, our esophagus and our rectum. It functions separate from our central nervous system and it communicates directly with our brain, right? Um, and what's really important here when we're talking about the, the connection between the gut and the brain is that is a two-way conversation, right? So our brain is sending signals to our enteric nervous system and our GI tract, right? um, to maybe, um, we need to ramp, ramp this up or ramp that down, right? Like, here's what you need to do to digest and here, you know, that's, and, but it also goes the other way and that our, that enteric nervous system also sends signals back to our brain. Um, and serotonin, 90% of our serotonin is created in the gut, right? And that's really important because when we talk about medication for depression and anxiety, um, where you, you often are on an SSRI, right? A serotonin, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. That's our, like the happy hormone, sometimes we'll call it, or it's really important for mood regulation. So that's showing up in the gut. So when we're talking about the gut brain connection, we're talking about the enteric nervous system, that lining of the GI tract. Um, that is in direct communication with our brain. And we can really think about it as like a second brain. And it's so important to think about that as a two-way conversation because our brain impacts what's happening in our GI tract, but our GI tract is also impacting what's happening in our brain. And that'll become relevant when we talk about um, CBT and therapeutic approaches shortly. Mm. And you probably see this pretty often that nobody wants to hear like stress management in that, like as a, as a way to help IBS symptoms, but it's so huge. And so what are some ways that we can really nourish that connection, the enteric nervous system and the vagus nerve? How can we take care of our vagus nerve? Yeah. So that's a giant question. And it's a really, it's a really good one. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right, right? Stress and anxiety will exacerbate or make worse um, our experience of GI distress, both in terms of reflux, which you mentioned, which is an upper GI condition and IBS, which is a lower GI condition. It's all, you know, it's all affected by what we're able to do. And so if, if anybody's listening and um, I, the biggest takeaway that we can talk about here is if we're talking about stress management and nobody wants to talk about stress management, this is a huge empowering set of skills, tools, and strategies available to you to affect how your GI system responds, right? So if we're focusing on that two-way conversation between your gut and your brain, if it's two ways, that means we're not just subject to what our GI system is doing, right? We're able to affect that um, with um, therapeutic strategies, actually. And the data is really clear that cognitive behavioral therapy, which I'll describe for you in a minute, is hugely effective in reducing GI distress. So, um, I have a giant answer about, um, the direct question you asked, but is there anything else coming up as I just kind of threw that out there before I, cause I can get going and just chatter away 
over here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just would piggyback on that and saying that um, it's practicing stress management and finding ways to reduce anxiety through therapy. That's I'm really open about that on, on my page that that has, was a huge pivotal um, piece of my healing, but all of those things will also benefit other areas of, of, of your mm-hmm. life. So it's just amazing, but continue. Yes. Other yeah. ways to, to nourish that. Okay. So um, the first kind of line of defense that I will put in place for clients is we want to be able to use the body as a tool um, to affect. So yes, we'll talk about like thoughts and behaviors here in a minute, but when we're thinking about being able to physically ground the body, and I think you're the yoga teacher yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So if we're grounding into the feet, if we're, if anybody, if you can feel the chair underneath your body right now, you can feel the chair supporting your back. You can feel, you know, take the palms, place them on the legs. Um, you can feel the weight and warmth of the palms on the legs, palms down, right. Which is more grounding. Um, we want to use the body to communicate to the brain that we're stable, we're fine, right? We don't need to have a fight or flight response, right? We can, we can calm everything down. Um, and we can also use the breath in that way um, to calm the body down. Because if we're pressing into our feet, if we're sitting still, if we're breathing evenly, even if we're holding our breath, right? There's a couple of strategies where we might hold our breath. All of those things send signals to the brain to say, we're, we don't need to chill out, right? I, if, if there were a real threat, I would be running right now, right? And I'm not running. I'm pressing my feet into the ground. I'm sitting in this chair and pressing my hands into the legs. I'm breathing deeply and evenly, right? And that tells your brain like, hang on, right? We turn the threat center on. Does the, does the threat center need to be on right now, right? Can we, can we turn it off? Can we calm the sympathetic nervous system down and activate the parasympathetic nervous system? And we can, we can do that with our feet, with our body, with our breath. It's amazing. Right. Yeah. So that's one. um, I'm going to tell you a story actually about a lion and a zebra, which I think might be helpful to illustrate the point. Right. Mm -hmm. So I want you to imagine that you are a zebra on the savanna and you are munching grass, happily munching grass, right? Not a care in the world, sunny, beautiful day, probably hot. If you're on the savannah, it's really hot on the savannah. Right. Um, and then you look over there and you see, a, you see a lion, right? And if you are a zebra and there is a lion, you are food it is a very real threat to your survival. Right. So the sympathetic nervous system where that fight or flight, um, response resides gets kicked on immediately upon seeing the lion. Right. And so what can happen is that um, our immediately our little zebra heart will start beating really quickly. Our breathing starts to get shallow. Um, our frontal prefrontal cortex goes offline, which is why a lot of times we feel like we can't concentrate, we can't think straight when we're anxious and having that experience of panic or anxiety, right? And the other thing that happens, which is really important for our conversation, is all that food that you just ate, right? Get rid of it get rid of it right now because it's going to weigh us down. It's dead weight, right? You don't need to spend any energy digesting that because we might not be alive to have it. Or sometimes the response is let's um, tighten all that up, right? And don't let go of it, right? But there's a GI response when that threat center gets turned on in the brain, right? Because either way, we don't want to be processing that food because there's a threat, right? So all of that stuff happens just that quick. And so let's say you've got really good evasive maneuvers in your little striped black and white body, right? And you get out of there and you get to a new Savannah, you get away from the lion. You're now um, on a new grassy knoll, right? And you're looking around and you're like, all right, sweet. Got away from the lion. That threat center automatically turns off and all that stuff in your body goes back to normal, right? And GI symptoms immediately go back to normal. But what happens for us in our modern society is we are a, a, you know, very svelte stripey zebra and we're seeing lions everywhere, everywhere. Right. And they're not actually lions. The email that you're afraid to open the conversation you're afraid to have with your boss, the the ordering from the barista. I mean, there's all kinds of things, right. That trigger our anxiety, million and one things. And we're labeling them all as lions in our nervous system. And so what we need to be able to do to be empowered, to turn that nervous system response off. And we can do that with the ways I just kind of described you with the body and teach you some more as well. But, um, the feet and the body and the breath can turn that threat center off and try to communicate to your brain. Like it's not, it's not a lion. It's, 
it's an email, right? It's not, it's not a scary email. It's totally fine. You're not going to get fired based on what's in that email. Um, but, you know, being able to turn that threat center to the off position, mm -hmm. we, can, we are able to do that with our breath and our body and some other things as well. Definitely. And if anyone is, is looking for more too, I know you have tons of resources, but also on my channel, I have some videos on breathing exercises and how to do those. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So then cognitive behavioral therapy is the next kind of level. Um, and again, this is kind of a one-on-one version of how this works, but I want you to think about how uh, important your thinking is to impact how you feel. So if you even think of something that makes you anxious or think of something that you're worried about, right. Um, that thinking can automatically start that physical response in the body, right? Like if we think about public speaking or we think about, um, I don't know, there's a million and one things getting on the subway, right. If we think about, um, tying into our IBS conversation, um, going out to dinner and having issues while you're having dinner, right. Going out on a date, going out with girlfriends or, um, like going out to dinner is a huge stressor for a lot of people with GI distress, right? Um, being trapped somewhere and not being able to find a bathroom, like a million and one things. So if you start thinking about that, we can ramp ourselves right up and create a threat in our mind. And then that activates the body, right? And it makes us feel anxious emotionally as well. Um, and so then in response to that anxious feeling, so we've got thoughts leading to feelings, and this is actually all interconnected, but just for, for um, linear purposes to explain, Thinking leads to feelings, feelings lead to behavior, right? In response to this feeling of anxiety, what do you do? Well, I make sure I, I don't go out to dinner. I don't go out to dinner at all, or I don't eat all day before I go out to dinner because that way I can be sure I'm not going to have a, re a response. I make sure to know where all the bathrooms are. I always have a modium on my person in case I need it at any time, right? Or Xanax. Um, there's all kinds of things that we do to try to control, predict, um, prevent, manage, make sure, double check all that stuff. Right. And the biggest thing that my clients have the hardest time overcoming is that sneaky part of behavior that we're doing to try to control actually makes our anxiety worse, which then makes our GI symptoms worse. Right. And we end up creating this vicious cycle of things that were intuitively makes total sense for us to do, um, but that ends up making it worse. And so like, this is like a light bulb going off for clients when they, when they yeah. see this and piece it together, because we can, and this is this empowerment part, right? That if we can identify the things that you're saying to yourself that aren't true, and if we can identify the behaviors that you're engaging in that feel like they're the right thing to do, but we figure out that they're actually making it worse, you have control over those things, right? We can change mm -hmm. the way you think. And we can change the behaviors you choose to reduce your level of anxiety and also reduce your experience of GI symptoms. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Super cool. Yes. Yes. And that cycle is totally something that resonated with me. And that's why having a psychologist and a dietitian on the care team is so important because disordered eating can make its way in there real quick. Yep. And that can worsen your GI symptoms. It can cause more anxiety. It puts psychological and physical stress on your body. Um, and it's just, it's, it's can be a cycle that I think people with IBS do. It's easy to find yourself there. Like it, there's, there's absolutely no shame and in, in judgment on that because it's easy. I mean, to, to get there. Like, yep. And it frankly is kind of a natural progression, right? Yep. Because if you have IBS and then you end up on a low FODMAP diet, which is very often prescribed um, by GI docs, right? And um, I've had just a ton of clients who've been on a low FODMAP diet, but it has not been explained to them appropriately that this is a temporary um, you know, opportunity. And then you reintroduce foods and see how your body responds to those. It's not meant to be a long-term dietary strategy. And what it does for a lot of people is create, which I think this is one of the questions we had, you know, talked about is, um, it creates a lot of fear around what you're eating. Yeah. Um, and so then there's tons and tons of foods that are off limits. And as you just described, disordered eating then can become a very natural, it's a, it's a, it makes total sense that that would be a thing that evolves out of this. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And for people with acid reflux, it's, it's similar. So there's all these trigger foods and, yep. and it's the stress about what I can eat and what I cannot eat can be very, very harmful and symptom provoking in itself. So 
Um, I'd love to talk more about that because I know that's something that people who are watching my YouTube videos are struggling a lot with. Um, I get a lot of comments and messages about, I don't know what to eat. It's just so much anxiety about food. And so do you have any tips or guidance on anxiety regarding food or navigating IBS with, with food fear? Yep. Yep. So the best way to kind of work through this is to create um, a hierarchy um, of the, so if you, if you're thinking about here's, here's the things that scare me just a little bit, right. Mild anxiety around eating those things. Here's the moderate ones. Here's the severe ones. And here's the ain't no way, Julia, am I ever eating that ever again? Because I know every single time I eat that, it's going to create this fear, right? So create that list. And a lot of times what we'll do is think about it on a scale of zero to hundred, right? So of how much distress or fear it causes, so zero to 30 is mild, 30 to 60 ish, right? Moderate, um, 60 to hundred is severe. And then anything above that, you know, a hundred plus is the ain't no way category, right? And then we start with the mild ones, start with the least scary foods. Cause if you have a very restrictive diet, right? I don't want you eating the ain't no way foods right away. Um, because you just have so much anxiety around eating that, that a lot of times when you do eat that, the, even, even if your body did respond okay to it, you have you create all this angst and anticipation and anxiety around it that um, sometimes that doesn't digest well, right? Um, so you start with small amounts and you start with the least scary foods. Um, and just, we also then need to have this mind-body awareness where you're watching what happens in the body when you eat that. Now, part of the part of the trouble is this um, two things. One is hypervigilance. So a lot of my clients that have GI symptoms are very, very aware <laughs> of how their body is responding to things, right? And so I'm going to tell you a story about an axe murderer in an alley, right? If you're getting ready to go down an alley, and uh, and you and um, I tell you that there's an axe murderer waiting in the alley for you, right? and you go through the alley, every little sound, every little, every little drip of water, every little scurry of a mouse, right? You're going to hear absolutely everything because you're on high alert for there to be someone to jump out with an ax, right? Um, versus if you don't know that that ax murderer is in there, right? You're going to go through the alley without that level. And you're not going to hear the water dripping. You're not going to hear the mouse scurrying, right? And so that's what we're doing is we're expecting an ax murderer right in our body we're just so aware and we've labeled it as something scary and bad and so then we end up creating that very thing so if you're going through these items on the hierarchy we're approaching it with how your body is responding knowing that you're primed to label it as bad and be really skeptical about that right like a lot because frankly the um overcoming this stuff requires, um, a diversity of gut bacteria and, yeah. um, right. And a, and a healthy gut biome. And the only way that we achieve that is with a, lot, a variety of foods. So yeah. any dietitian you're going to talk to, right. Any GI doc, they're going to tell you, you need a variety of foods. And so for folks who have this very restrictive diet out of fear of eating things, um, are ju you're just going to perpetuate these GI symptoms. So the way, um, out is always through, right? So you have to, it's, this is basically like mini exposure therapy where you're exposing yourself to the least scary foods first, non-judgmentally observing what happens with the body. Most of the time, you know, I don't know, you maybe have some bloating or like something happens, but it's not going to be intolerable. The other thing I will say is, um, Dr. Nicole Deneza, who I think you spoke to, um, yes. speaks beautifully to this talks about how, um, when we eat something new, um, and I think she gave an example of like with her child, um, when you're starting to give new foods to babies, if you give them something new, you expect their poop to look different, right? This is a food they haven't ever had before. And so the body's like, Hey, what's this? Right. And it processes it differently. So, so if this is a food you haven't had in a long time, we're going to expect the body to, to have a response. Right. And so what we do is we label it, label that response as bad, and it might very well not be bad. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I'll acknowledge is that um, at least with IBS um, there and with a lot of clients with GI distress, they have something called visceral hypersensitivity, which means they are actually going to feel things more 
than the person without GI difficulties. Um, so they're going to feel more like uh, my body's going to do the same thing their body does, but I might not. Um, even if I weren't looking for the ax murderer, right. I might not notice it because it just happens in my body, but they're going to have more sensitivity to that. So they're going to notice it more. So just being aware that you have like the superpower, right. That you can feel things that the average person can't feel mm. and just be super careful to not be labeling those things as bad. And then you work your way up the hierarchy, right? Um, and you build confidence. So once you work your way through the mild foods, um, and oh, I guess that's the other point I was going to make with Dr. Demez's comment is that if you eat it and you have a response, you probably need to eat it again, <laughs> right? Um, and this is, of course, barring saying like folks with celiac should not be eating gluten. Like there's all these things. Like if you have a legit food allergy, don't be... Right right? This is not for inflammatory bowel diseases and these kinds of things, right? These rules do not apply um, for this. Right, right. Yes. Yes. That's and an important qualifier. Exactly. And um, in my interview on acid reflux with Dr. Nicole Deneza, who's, which is also on my page, she talked about sort of like the difference between like IBS and reflux is that like the symptoms that occur, they feel more urgent, or intense with acid reflux, sometimes not always, but sometimes because of the risk for barrettes and like the damage, potential, potential damage on the esophagus. And so I think that that is a little bit of like a nuance point, but I wanted to bring it up because um, with people with acid reflux, sometimes they are given this huge list of foods, which they are told they can never eat again, mm. but that isn't all that also may not be true because amount matters the time of day matters the way that you combine the food matters like coffee with food coffee without food um all yeah. these different things are it's, it's really important to again work with a dietitian to understand like your individual triggers but as far as fear of i can never eat a tomato again that really may not be true. Once you have yeah. your symptoms under control, you can have a few cherry tomatoes in a dish. And so that sort of flexibility is important because I know that people with acid reflux will also say no to the dinner. And yeah. then that also causes anxiety and just, and can really impact digestion overall. So, um, wanted to bring that point up, but, but totally agree with, with yeah. everything yeah. you said. So I will also say, yeah. So I will never tell clients what to eat because I am right. not a dietitian. <laughs> I hang out with a lot of dietitians and um, treat yeah. a lot of clients that are seeing dietitians. So we're having a lot of these conversations, but that's why that um, if you really are scared about what to eat, um, like the tomatoes, if you, all those foods that you've been told you can never eat again, we put those in the ain't no way category for now, right? Yep. We don't start with those. Um, and having a dietitian, and if you have so much anxiety about eating those things, whenever I'm talking with dietitians, a lot of times they're, they're asking me like, when, when would be a good time to send a client to you for that support? And a lot of the reasons that is, is because the anxiety around eating those foods is preventing their dietetic work from being effective, right? Because it's the fear around eating those foods that prevents them from being able to make progress with the dietitian, even though they have all the information, it's just this fear of eating those things that um, prevents them from moving forward, which is that um, anxiety connection, right? And mm -hmm. then that of course just makes everything so much worse because it's exacerbating those GI symptoms too, so. For sure. And so what I also oftentimes see, um, not really, I, I'm not a dietitian, so I, I don't personally see this, but um, the just what I've heard and what I've seen in the comments on YouTube is that um, people have food fears before having IBS. And then sometimes that disordered eating can then kind of spiral into IBS. And so when the food fear comes before, do you have any tips on that or just food fear out of weight gain or out of other like body image, that whole mm -hmm. connection? Yeah. So that's a giant topic, right? And, the, and yeah. there's so many reasons why people avoid um, certain foods part, I mean, part of it there, and there is a difference between disordered eating and emotional eating and eating disorders. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we would be approaching treatment with those things in a very different way, but it is, um, if we would really be exploring the underlying fear around why those foods are being, um, avoided, 
right? Um, and assessing to see if there's a, a larger eating disorder issue there, in which case um, an, a very specific eating disorder therapist would probably, it would be a more effective fit than I would be. Um, but generally speaking, the, the reasons why the food is feared and the reasons why the food is being disordered is gonna be the rationale that leads us to being able to address how to go about getting through that, right? So um, when we're thinking about that thought behavior, our thought feeling behavior cycle, and we're thinking about the thoughts around food, we really, I ask a lot of clients, you know, if we're talking about tomatoes, why are you afraid of eating a tomato? And we're looking to see how accurate those thoughts actually are. Because if you really believe that that tomato is gonna tear up your esophagus, right? It makes a whole lot of sense that you're anxious about eating that tomato. So we would want to look at that and say, how accurate are those thoughts? Be crit you know, have some critical analysis, be skeptical um, and look at the actual data and the evidence, because a lot of times the fears are um, not rooted in, in true um, data, right? Because anxiety, so much about anxiety is um, about irrational thoughts or unreasonable thoughts. Um, and so some of them are valid and reasonable and we need to be concerned, right? And, but a lot of times um, it's not. And so that we would want to start there and tackle that and examine um, the narrative around the fear of the tomato, right? Or the narrative around carbs for weight gain or, you know, some, any of this, whenever we're cutting anything at all out um, categorically, um, that's usually a problem. That's usually an indication of black and white thinking, right? that it's good or bad. And there are things that are good or bad. Gluten for folks with celiac, bad, categorically bad. They can't eat that, right? Yeah. It's um, very dangerous. But for, I would say that people with celiac are such a small, small percentage of the population that we've adopted this. I can't eat gluten. I can't eat dairy. I can't um, eat tomatoes. Like, you know, all these things. And it actually creates this disordered eating and all of these fears that then result, and then it creates more problems in the GI tract because um, if they had been eating a normal, balanced kind of variety of foods, then maybe some of those things wouldn't have developed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, super important. Yep. Um, and so, in general, navigating anxiety about symptoms. Um, how do you have any tips on that, or what are some ways that that we can navigate anxiety surrounding GI, whether that's IBS or acid reflux. Yep. So the same kind of model applies, right? And actually with the caveat. So we would apply the, um, or I guess it's not a caveat, but we would apply the thought feeling behavior cycle to that, right? To say, again, what are you telling yourself about your symptoms? How much of that is actually true, right? Like I'm afraid I'm going to go and not get to a bathroom on time when that has never, ever happened right? But that they're, it's catastrophizing. The what ifs around so much of this are so, so damaging and they end up being so limiting, right? So we're looking at the stories that people tell, the narratives that they have around their symptoms. And we want to be curious and skeptical about how true those things are. Some of those things might be hundred percent true, right? And, but most of them might not be. And if we're going based on that Intel and the thinking, then that can be really limiting. Um, and then we also would be looking at some of those avoidance behaviors that we talked about, right? So the symptoms prevent you from doing things or all of the behaviors that you're doing to kind of control, um, your symptoms, how much of that is actually effective and how much of that is actually making it worse. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're wanting to combine, um, cognitive and behavioral interventions. Um, and my goal for my clients is always to have them be able to, have a really clear idea of the landscape of their anxiety, whether it's IBS symptoms or GI symptoms that are causing that anxiety or social anxiety or whatever, right? The model is going to apply where I want to, we want to know what's triggering you like what, and sometimes we don't know, but right. A lot of times we know what it is that's setting us off. What am I telling myself about that? Being able to connect those thoughts and feelings and realize that I'm feeling this way because this is what I'm thinking right? Mm -hmm. And then what am I doing in response to that, that could be making this better or worse. And so once we start to figure out that landscape of an individual person's experience of anxiety, because all those factors are going to be individual for each person, right? Um, they are just much more in control and much more empowered to make decisions about those things. And then the other, um, the caveat I mentioned is 
there's also a huge part of acceptance that comes with this. So I have a lot of clients that kind of rail against, you know, this, the GI symptoms that they're having in the GI distress where, um, it's, you know, this sucks. I hate this. I have no control over this and I wish I didn't have it. And all of that we totally get makes complete and total sense, but we want to address that mindset as well, because if this is happening and we can't change it, you know, make it go away today, wishing it weren't here, kind of keeps us stuck in that place of suffering, right? Because whenever we're wishing that something isn't the way that it actually is, um, then we stay stuck in that place. And so being able to say like, I'm not, you don't have to be happy about it, right? Accepting it doesn't mean that you have to be happy about it. Um, but being able to say, this is happening. Um, I'm learning what to do about this. Um, it's not, it, this is temporary. It's not going to be like this forever, right? I'm going to learn some balance around how to manage this. Um, but this is happening right now. Um, that's a very different mindset than being in that place of negativity. And because it can create a lot of hopelessness, these symptoms, right? And especially when you're feeling helpless, um, being able to shift some of that can be really, really important. Yes. Mindset is, is huge. And, and that was huge. And in, in um, my personal experience, just shifting the narrative from, I have symptoms no matter what I do to, I have symptoms, but I'm learning more about my body every day. And, and like, I'm learning how to take care of myself in a different way, because when you have these things, you sometimes have to learn how to take care of yourself in a different way. And and still go out and enjoy these dinners in life. And mm -hmm. um, so in, when, I can, when I talk to people that I can tell are really anxious about their symptoms and about their conditions, I always recommend to stop Googling and just see a yes. medical professional because the Googling, I'm sure you probably see this, that can spiral into like something else is wrong with me. I have an autoimmune condition, like all these things. So yep. Yeah, that's huge. So if we're plugging that into our thought behavior feeling cycle, right? The thought is, you know, what if, what if I have this, they're feeling anxious and then the Googling makes it worse, right? Because it's, we're seeking information. We're trying to find a way to control that, um, to prevent it, to make sure. And um, I treat a lot of folks with health anxiety and yes. the very first rule in our very first session is no Googling no Googling, right? Like, um, which I, in this day and age is really hard, right? But no Googling of health conditions. And I actually, I will have clients clear their cache, clear their search history, clear the, because Google will start showing you what you want to see. So mm -hmm. I have clients who, you know, they're like, um, Googling any random thing. And it's like, um, you know, whatever, and autoimmune diseases blank and autoimmune diseases. Like it's just filtering the results. So um, I've had a lot of clients have good success in, uh, in being able to steer clear of some of that content. Like if they're getting on there to look for a chili recipe or whatever, right. Chili recipes for autoimmune diseases. Like it just filters those results for that um, thing that you've been searching for. So you still need to be able to be on the internet and search for information, but we, we definitely want to stay like what no WebMD, no, none, even Mayo clinic, like all of these very Cleveland clinic, all these very reputable sites, no searching Google scholar and reading research articles, like none of this, right? Yeah. Um, because we, when we do that, we, the benign information, the benign information is there and it is ignored, right? You mm -hmm. skim over all of that and you go down to the section. On, yes. Yep. That is a guaranteed methodology for, um, so that's a good, perfect example. I'm so glad you brought that up of being able to say like the thing you think you're doing to make yourself feel better makes it worse. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's such, I thought there's anything we can kind of convey, um, with managing this, that that's a huge part of it. Cause I think a lot of people have a hard time picking those things out on their own. Um, and that's where a lot of my work with clients is really beneficial because that's, it's so hard to see that in, in the way that, because intuitively it makes total sense that you would be seeking information online about this thing yeah. that you're nervous about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, right. Yep. So I want to make sure we get to some of the questions. We have a couple questions that were submitted. The first one is how does our brain react when we don't eat enough calories or food? Yeah. Okay. So um, our brain 
is it's very, it's very energy hungry, right? It's extremely powerful and it takes a lot of energy to keep our brain going. And you have to think about what the brain is responsible for doing. It's the command center, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when we think of our brain, we're thinking of cognition and memory and thinking and um, concentration and all those kinds of things, but it's also responsible for major things like heartbeat and breathing and all those autonomic things that we were talking about that happen automatically. Right. So our brain needs fuel. So if we're not eating enough and we're not um, taking in enough calories, then the brain is going to have to make some decisions about where its energy output goes. Right. And it's not going to sacrifice on the heartbeat and the breathing and the kidney function and all those things. Right. So some of the things that it can get rid of quickly are um, the cognition, which is a huge, huge job, right, of, of our brain. So brain fog, right? We might have trouble remembering things. We might have trouble um, concentrating. We might have poor sleep. Um, there's lots of other things that, you know, can kind of come from that too, where we're thinking about um, what the brain is responsible for doing mm. and how it manages um, like, uh, poor sleep, obviously fatigue. So we would, well, if we're not, if we don't have enough energy for the brain to function, then we're going to be working on low power. So we're going to have, um, less energy and, and we're, and it also gives us poor sleep. We're going to recover poorer from exercise because that's taking more energy and we're not fueling our body to be able to do that correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's a big one. Mm. Second question is how can we control or ease our stomach when we feel excited and, or anxious? And you can, maybe the person also meant just like ease the body. So you can, you can go that route or ease the mind, whatever, however you want to attack it. Yeah. So the quickest, um, the quickest thing that we can think about with, so we're trying to increase that mind body awareness, right? So if we know that we're getting excited or anxious and our stomach is getting upset, And we want the biggest, most important thing is to activate that parasympathetic nervous system. So breath work is the quickest and easiest way to be able to do that. Right. Um, And so you mentioned you have some recordings or some um, videos of breath work. Some of the quickest breath work exercises that I recommend are um, diaphragmatic breathing, which is just belly breathing. But frankly, I find for a lot of my clients with GI distress that belly breathing can be triggering, right? When we're inhaling, we're expanding the belly. Um, and I have a lot of clients that don't want to focus on the belly, right? <laughs> Especially when it's their stomach that is anxious or excited, um, or they're having some sensation there. Um, so I actually will recommend box breathing for clients, which is, um, and it's a strategy to engage the calming part of the nervous system, right? So you picture a box and it's got four equal sides um, and you go around the box, four count, inhale, four count, hold, four count, exhale through the nose, four count, hold. So when you go around the box, it's inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale, hold, exhale, hold. Um, And the beauty of this is that there's enough going on that it interrupts some of that anxious thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Cause you're counting and you're holding your breath and you're, it's engaging enough that hopefully it's creating a pause for us to focus on that and keep us engaged enough to be able to think about what we're doing. Um, and I would say go around that box at least 10 times, um, ideally as many as you're able to, um, and then, and, and, or any of the other breathing exercises that you've recommended, um, if that's too much, like sometimes the easiest thing to do is simply have a longer exhale than an inhale. So if you're inhaling, like, um, and counting your inhale and then exhaling for longer, right. But the breath work is the quickest and easiest way to be able to activate that calming part of the nervous system. And then what's really cool. I have tons of clients tell me this, that they start doing this regularly and they, and when their stomach is upset and they can feel their stomach settle down. Right. So cool. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that we would want to do then is do this in combination, right? So if you're feeling anxious or excited, you're going to calm things down and then you're going to be like, okay, I'm getting worked up about this. And that's when you're going to engage that calming self-talk right? To say, what am I saying to myself here? I'm saying that I'm going to go there and I'm going to have trouble when I'm having dinner and that, you know, it's going to be totally fine. Right. So you're starting to engage that calm, challenging that narrative of your what ifs and your catastrophizing. 
and a lot of that stuff, right? So if we're using that breathwork in combination with self-talk that's more reality-based, that can be really, really effective. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely huge. So any other general tips that you'd like to to leave the audience with as far as supporting the gut-brain connection or seeking CBT? Um, I think the one thing I, I think I've kind of called them out as we've gone along, right? Yeah. But the, some of the biggest things are being aware of that two-way street of our brain communicating with our gut and our gut communicating with our brain, that that is an empowering option for us, right? That we can, that's why CBT is effective. That's why CBT and breath work um, and addressing these avoidance behaviors that we were talking about, or the, the things that you're doing to try to keep yourself safe. That's why those things are effective to reduce your anxiety and your experience of gut symptoms. Because when you do those things with your brain, it sends those signals to the gut, right? Um, to be like, oh, I'm a zebra and there isn't a lion, right? I'm going to go to dinner because there's nothing scary at dinner, right? I'm not going to carry emodium with me because I'm not going to need it. And the, actually, now that we're talking about this, I'm so glad that we're kind of going down this rabbit hole because the other thing that's really important is when you tell yourself that stuff, if you, you actually have to believe it in order for it to be effective, you can't trick yourself, right? So if you leave the emodium at home and you go to dinner and then you, you get there and you're freaking out about not having the emodium, you're going to create the very thing, you know, that you were trying to avoid by leaving the emodium at home. So you leave it at home because you're certain that you're not going to need it. And you go into this dinner knowing that you're not going to need it. Right. You have to believe that because your yep. brain and your gut will not be tricked. <laughs> and right. So true. So true. And I, I have said this in a previous interview, but I had to believe that I could get better before I did. Yep. And that is, it's, it's really hard when you're like deep in, in the thick of symptoms, but really believing that I could get better instantly calmed my nervous system. I feel like, and yeah. was, was, I visualized myself feeling well and it, that can go a long way. Yeah. So two thoughts on that one being that if the reason that it did, because it really would have calmed your nervous system, because if you believe you're going to get better, it's removing the threat. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it, remo then it turns that threat system off. So mm -hmm. I'm sure that that is actually, that's exactly what happened. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is if you don't believe that you're going to be okay, if you don't believe, like if you're in the thick of it and you don't really believe that, then don't tell yourself that tell yourself something you do actually believe, right. 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 As the lip service of, um, cause especially a lot of my emotional eating clients or my body image clients, like they hate their bodies and telling them they love themselves like that doesn't work because they don't believe that yet. Right. We get there eventually, but they don't believe that. And so when, you, what you say to yourself would actually have to be something that you are not going to discount. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Cause then you talk yourself right out of it. <laughs> so like, I'm, right. I'm learning how to manage this. There are other people who have figured, who know about how to do this and I'm learning from them. Right. Like I, I, um, I'm a smart, capable, intelligent person. I have great resources and I, I'm, I don't have it figured out yet, but I'm working to figure it out. Right. Like yeah. that, that can maybe not turn the threat center off altogether, but it can lower the temperature of that. Yeah. So it brings everything down. Right. Yeah. Yep. Great. Yeah. Yeah. That's excellent. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation that I'm sure people will, will find benefit from. And thank you for taking the time. Where can people find more of you? Oh yeah. So, um, website is root to flourish.com. Um, and it, I'm root to flourish on both Instagram and Facebook. Um, I do have, I can mention, um, in the next couple of weeks, I have a free masterclass, um, five lessons in total, um, called how to stop feeling anxious. So we're going to go over some of what we've talked about in a little more detail, um, describing kind of the three keys to overcoming anxiety, which is um, mindfulness, the power of thought and empowered behavior. Um, so I'm recording those now. That's really fun. Um, so cool. that's coming, but yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Julia. This was awesome. You're welcome. It was a pleasure.